Welcome everyone uh, to another one of our Sharks for Kids webinars. Uh, we're super excited to have everyone joining us. My name is Jillian. I'm the founder of Sharks for Kids and it's been an amazing journey. We've met a lot of cool people and I'm super excited about today's session because I'm absolutely fascinated with the work um, that Dr. George Lauder, uh, Lauder is doing. And I think you're really gonna be uh, excited to see some of the amazing imagery that's being created uh, as scientists are learning about sharks, but not just sharks, their skin in particular. So um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lauder, for joining us today. Uh, Dr. Lauder is a professor of organismal and evolutionary biology at Harvard University. Um, and is also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And today, I'm really excited. I think you guys are gonna enjoy this because we've obviously been talking a lot about sharks, their movement, their anatomy, uh, behaviors, habitats. We've covered a lot, but today we're gonna get up close with the skin and it's really, really fascinating. So thank you so much to everyone for joining us. Throw those questions in the QAA. And without further ado, I'm gonna let Dr. George Lauder get started. Thank you. Jillian, th thanks so much and, and welcome everybody. It's a great pleasure to, um, to tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing on sharks uh, over the years from our uh, research point of view. I know we have a big age range here, so I'll try and keep it uh, fairly general. And if you have any questions uh, that you would like to ask, please put them in the Q&A. And I'm happy to answer questions afterwards. If you wanted to email me, you could email me uh, or follow me on Twitter. Occasionally I post uh, shark things on Twitter. There's a lot of uh, fish things that get posted and fish robot things also. So let's get started with uh, the, the skin of sharks. So most of you, I'm sure, uh, especially if you've been following the sharks for kids, um, are well aware of many of the amazing features of sharks. And uh, certainly in the popular literature, uh, we see uh, lots of focus on the jaws here. I hope uh, you can see my pointer. I've activated the laser pointer, so circling the jaws here. Sharks, of course, are very well known for uh, their amazing swimming ability, their feeding ability, the diversity of jaws and, and feeding systems that they have. But we've been studying the skin of sharks, and it might seem like an odd thing to focus on at first, but uh, we're extremely excited to be working on the skin. There are lots of amazing features of shark skin. It's one of their most uh, remarkable biological uh, aspects. So let's take a look at the skin. So what is it about the skin here that's so interesting on the surface of a swimming shark? Um, they are covered with tiny little scales or denticles as they're called uh, in sharks. It's an amazing feature. When you look, we look back at the surface of a shark, you just don't realize that they're covered with these amazing little structures. And there's quite a diversity of these structures. This is just gives you one uh, image. Here's another image of a different species of sharks with these tiny little uh, tooth-like structures called the denticles or scales. And we can zoom in and blow these up they're um, um, very beautifully sculpted. They're quite small. There's a, quite a bit of variation among sharks, but in the scientific measurement, this is about 130 microns. That's not too much bigger than a human hair in diameter. Some shark scales are much bigger than this, but a fast swimming open ocean shark, uh, this would be about the size of each individual surface elements. So it's sort of human hair thickness, a few human hairs in thickness, which is quite small. Thickness of a sheet of paper, for example. It's, they're very small in open ocean sharks. Other sharks that sit on the bottom, uh, like a nurse shark, for example, would have much bigger uh, denticles or scales. Um, they vary tremendously in different species. So I've shown you here um, the surface structures on the skin of four different species of sharks. You can see how much they vary. Some of them are round and look like little plugs. Some are kind of pointy and well spaced out. Other species have a closely overlapping pattern of the uh, skin surface denticles. 
Um, some are a little bit bigger than others. Uh, mako sharks tend to have pretty small denticles. Other species tend to be a little bit bigger. So there's quite a diversity of skin coverings. And even around the body, these vary quite a bit. So skin surface denticles on the nose tend to be a flattened and closely packed like little paver or, or bricks. Um, uh, on the fins, they can be more widely spaced out. On the body, a little more closely packed. But there's just a tremendous diversity of these. And when you just see a shark swimming by or you uh, look at one, um, that if you have a specimen of a shark, it's just hard to appreciate how amazing the diversity of surface structures on sharks is. So what might these uh, surface structures look like? One of the other remarkable features is that they're actually, each one, even though sharks are covered with thousands of these, each one is like a tiny little tooth. So on the left, I've shown you an image from a textbook of what a human tooth looks like. So your teeth are covered with an enamel outer layer, a little inner dentine layer, which is a, a, a mineralized substance, and then an inner cavity, a pulp cavity, that has blood vessels and nerves in it. So all of your teeth look like that, but shark skin scales have a very similar structure. They have an outer enamel-like layer, an inner dentine-like layer, and a pulp cavity. And they're embedded in the skin, much like your teeth are embedded in the, the bone of your, your jaws. It's an amazing thing that sharks have you know, many, many thousands of these. Each one is like a tiny little tooth. So sharks are covered with teeth. Now, what are all these teeth doing? on the surface of a shark? Well, there have been many ideas and scientists are still trying to figure that out and it's, it's a big effort that we're making in my lab also. Um, one of the most uh, prominent, I would say, ideas is that by covering the body with these little structures, little tooth-like structures, it can reduce the amount of effort it takes to move through the water. And if you've certainly followed the Sharks for Kids, you're well aware that sharks are big swimmers. Uh, many of them migrate thousands of miles. They're very active animals for the most part. And it could be that this has an effect on locomotion. And that's something I'll say more about in a moment. But there are other ideas too. Maybe it strengthens the skin against uh, animals that want to bite them. Uh, even some um, other sharks will bite each other in, in their interactions. Um, it might deter parasites from attaching to the skin surface. And there are some other ideas also. But let's focus on this first one, that maybe if you cover your skin with little tiny tooth-like structures, it actually helps you swim better. And the way to think about that is this. If you want to move through the water or move through the air with as little effort as possible, is it better to be smooth or is it better to be rough? So let's think about that for a moment. I've shown you here a smooth ball on the left and a ball with some surface roughness on the right. I think most people initially, your first reaction would be, oh, to move through the water with as little effort as possible, to, to be as effective at poss as possible at swimming, you want to be as smooth as possible. But it turns out that it's actually better to be rough. But you need to have the right kind of roughness. And it needs to be the right size and the right spacing. And an example of how you might think about that is to think of a golf ball. Golf balls, as we all know, have these dimples on the surface. And the reason they have the dimples is that it makes them travel much farther through the air than if they were smooth. So it's better for a golf ball to be rough and have these, this dimpled textured surface than it is for them to be smooth. It, it really tremendously increases the distance that the golf ball goes when um, a golfer hits it with a, with a club. Now, why is that? 
Well, without going too much into the science of it all, let's compare a smooth ball moving through the air with a rough ball shown on the bottom here moving through the air. A smooth ball, the air will come down, it passes around the smooth surface here, and it leaves behind it a wake on the, on the back side of the ball. If the golf ball is textured with these dimples, that wake is much thinner, it's, it's narrower. And that comes from the fact that the dimples cause a turbulence in the flow, it causes the flow of air to become more chaotic. And as it moves over the golf ball, it holds on to the golf ball a little longer. And so you have a thinner wake compared to the thick wake of a smooth ball. And that thinner wake reduces the drag force. It reduces the energy that the ball is taking from the fluid and it enables it to move farther. So it's better to be rough than smooth. It's better to have a certain kind of roughness. And so that's one of the ideas of shark skin denticles. It helps them reduce the uh, energy moving through the water. And since most shark species swim a great deal in their lifetime, the thought is that this is one way that it allows them to reduce the energy of swimming. And we can see that in human applications, various people have tried to mimic um, shark skin surfaces in wetsuits. Speedo made a famous wetsuit that had a shark skin-like surface. Um, and it greatly increased the swimming speed of the swimmers. And we've actually imaged the surface of these swimsuits. It doesn't look much like shark skin. These are two different model Speedo swimsuit fabrics. But you can see that indeed they are textured. They're not as smooth as possible. They've made a slightly bumpy fabric texture that has the same effect as the identical surface, the scale surface of shark skin. It, it, it's a golf ball-like effect. It, it reduces the force needed to move through the water. And as a result, the full body swimsuits were banned from, from Olympic swimming. They were having too great, and causing too great an improvement of swimming speeds. So the shark skin effect, the textured roughened surface effect, I think is pretty well documented. Now, how are we studying shark skin in the lab? I want to give you just a few pieces of information about what we're doing scientifically to better understand how shark skin works. And there are four sort of topics, and I'll just say a few words about each one. We're trying to do some new imaging, use some new imaging approaches to see the surface of shark skin. We're doing some 3D printing of different shark skin surfaces so we can better understand the surface. We're doing some robotic experiments where we can measure the force on the surface of the skin. And we're doing some experiments with living sharks because ideally we'd like to see what the flow of water is like right on the surface um, of a shark. So let's take a look at, at some of these. One of the things we've done is used a CT scanning to image individual shark skin scales or denticles. I have a movie here on the right showing you the 3D surface. I hope uh, that's playing well. Um, and you can see on the left hand side what the nose denticles look like compared to body denticles. They're quite uh, different in shape. And the, the movie on the right shows you what one, just one of these individual shark skin denticles is like. The expanded part on the bottom is embedded in the skin. The flattened sort of triangular ridge part that sticks up, sticks out into the water. And of course, there are tens of thousands of these all over the body of a shark. We've also been using a new technique that allows us to image the shark skin surface in three dimensions. So here on the upper left is a, one of our undergraduates actually using a device that she's holding, pressing on to the surface of, of a shark that gives us a three-dimensional image. You can see the Oreo surface here in the upper right, and we can um, use that to directly image in three dimensions the surface of sharks. So I've got a little movie 
rotating here on the lower right. Color indicates the height of the shark skin surface. So red color are the very tips of the denticles, whereas the blue colors are the valleys. And you can see that what that 3D textured surface on the shark skin is like. And it's a very exciting new technique. We can actually do this on live animals. So from a live shark, we can very quickly image the skin surface in three dimensions. And understanding what the three-dimensional surface of shark skin is like has been a big advance for us in understanding the biology of sharks. And I'll show you another one here. We have um, two images of shark skin on the left. One is just a black and white image. The other is the color image with the height. And then we can play a little movie, rotating it around. Again, you can see the red colors are the highest points. The blue colors, which you can see a few spots there, are some of the valleys present on the surface of shark skin. And so this three-dimensional structure, which we have in the computer, allows us then also to 3D print these uh, skin surfaces and do testing in the lab. Now, one of the things you might have noticed from the previous uh, slide is that there are holes in the surface of the shark's skin sometimes. So here's a picture of a leopard shark. And for the most part, the surface has these very nice denticles. They're all closely tiled with each other, sitting right next to, to each other. But occasionally, there are holes in the surface. And this is something we've gotten quite interested in recently for for a number of reasons. Um, it, it is unusual to see all these holes in published pictures of shark skin, but now that we're looking for them, we find them everywhere. And it seems to be a very normal feature of shark skin to have these, these gaps in the surface. Um, I'll say more about those in a second. I'll just show you here some of the 3D prints we've been doing of shark skin. Um, you can see these little identicals, little scales, we've attached them to a, a wing-like structure. Um, 3D printing denticles here in the lower right-hand side, little simple ones that stick out from a flexible surface here on the lower left. We're trying to 3D print all sorts of different surface structures so we can better understand the um, effect of texture, of roughness on water flow over the surface. So I want to come back now to the little holes that we noticed in the surface of shark skin. And one of the first places we really saw these very obviously was on the tail of thresher sharks. So I don't know how many of you know about thresher sharks, but they have an enormous tail, as you can see. They do very cool things with it. Uh, there have been a number of studies showing how they use this tail. Um, you can see how big it is here. Here's one of our undergraduates, Megan, who worked on the surface of thresher shark tails for her undergraduate uh, college research project. And you can see the tail of a thresher shark that she's sitting in front. The tail is almost as long as the body. It's huge. And the research that's been done on thresher sharks has shown how they use this tail to capture prey. And so I'm gonna show a movie that comes from a publication from some other researchers who, who were able to obtain video of thresher sharks feeding. Um, hopefully uh, we'll play it a few times, but you're gonna see the thresher shark come up and whack small fish by whipping its tail over its head. And then it stuns the small fish and you'll see it turn around and catch some of the small fish right there that have been stunned by this tail as, it, as they use it as a, as a weapon, essentially, during feeding. It's an amazing structure. You can see how long it is, how flexible it is. It's a, a, a remarkable shark behavior. And one of the things that we noticed was when we looked at the tail of thresher sharks, there are tr a tremendous number of holes that you see. So the surface is not this perfect surface. It's got many little holes that characterize it, and you can see all those holes here. So what is going on with these holes? It seems to be that they are missing denticles, that individual scales have been lost, 
Um, perhaps it's no surprise if the tail's being used as a feeding structure, almost like a, a whip or a, a weapon, um, that there would be some damage. But you can see all these holes, and we decided to look inside some of the holes to see what's in there. And one of the things we noticed was some of the holes have smaller scales or denticles that appear to be growing underneath, growing up from below into the holes. So here's an image of a hole. I'm circling it now in the red laser pointer. And you can see the denticle coming into that hole from below. You can also see a lot of damage on the surface of the denticles. A lot of shark skin um, denticles that the textured surface is, is damaged, um, especially on the edges. And so you might think, well, eventually these damaged denticles fall out and they get then replaced by denticles coming from below. So we think this is the first evidence of replacement denticles coming in to keep the shark skin surface uh, regenerating. Much like sharks replace their teeth, now we have evidence that they're replacing the individual denticles on their surface. And here's another view where we were able to cut the surface of a piece of shark skin. You can see the mature or fully formed denticles on the surface here. And then here's an, a, a replacement denticle coming in uh, from below. So it's an amazing thing. We were able to make some 3D models of this. Um, here we have a, a series of denticles we've colored in uh, different colors. The gold one here is a replacement one that's coming in to fill the gap in that surface that you can see as it rotates around right in here is the gap and there's a new replacement denticle coming in to um, into the gap formed by one of the denticles that was lost. So that was a very exciting uh, advance for us in the last few years to realize and be able to image that sharks are replacing their denticles on the skin surface. Another thing we've been doing research-wise is to do some experimental measurements of shark skin. Um, we did that by removing pieces of skin from a shark, um, making very thin little skin pieces, attaching them to different structures that we can move. So these are pieces of skin here that are attached to metal rods that we can then move in a computer control system to understand in the laboratory how the shark skin moves and how water moves over the surface. And you can see what the surface of that uh, looks like here on the right. And I'll show you just a movie. Here's a 3D printed shark skin surface. It's swimming in the laboratory. Um, and we're moving it back and forth. There's water moving from the left here to the right over the surface, and we can make all sorts of measurements of the water flow and the force and understand better how this is actually moving through the water. So that's, we have a whole robotic aspect of how we're trying to understand shark skin. And finally, I wanna just wrap up now by saying that our goal, the ideal, would be to be able to understand how water is moving over the surface of live sharks. And if you think about the difficulty of that, of a white shark swimming through the ocean, a thresher shark, a mako shark out in the ocean, how would we be able to image the water moving over the surface of a fast-moving shark with tiny little surface structures uh, in the open ocean, it's impossible. We'll never be able to do that, or at least uh, for some time. But there are some things we can do. We can use some species of sharks that are easy to work with in the laboratory. And here is a chain cat shark, which likes to sit on the bottom. It's very easy to work with. It breathes, so I'm going to show you a movie of it breathing here. You can see the water coming out over the gills, and that water is coming out, and it's moving over the skin right here where I'm highlighting. And so if we image right where I put this little blue bar, 
with some specialized camera equipment will be able to see the water moving over the surface of the shark skin. We can zoom way in and see water as it moves over shark skin denticles, something we really never could do in an open ocean, fast moving shark. And so to wrap up, I'm just gonna show you a movie of water moving over the skin of a cat shark from the previous slide, same species. And you can see these individual denticles here. And you're gonna see the water, which we've put a bunch of tiny little particles in so we can see the water flow. So here's the skin moving, and you can see the water moving down over the surface, and we can see these individual shark denticles as they are um, interfacing with the surface of the water, as they're encountering the water surface. And there's some interesting things to look at here. One of the things that you can see, if we wait till the movie replays again, so as the movie comes out again here, look at the denticles here, and you'll see them move back toward the body right in here. They kind of fold in toward the body. And we think this is some of the first evidence that sharks might actually be able to control the angle and the, the surface texture themselves actively that they have some, might have some control over these surface structures, over their skin denticles, as they encounter the water flow. So we're super excited to work on this in the future. We're, uh, we have a, still quite a bit of work to do on this, uh, on this topic. So let me wrap up and close by saying that when you see pictures of sharks like this, when you see movies of sharks swimming around in the ocean, if you're lucky enough to go snorkeling or diving and see sharks moving through the water, you can of course be very impressed by their jaws, by their swimming ability, but please don't forget about their amazing skin and how that skin has thousands and thousands of tiny tooth-like structures and with amazing properties, how uh, water might be moving over it. Think about what the, how the textured surface of sharks is helping them move through the fluid. It's one of the amazing features of sharks, and sharks have many amazing features, but it's certainly the one we've been interested in focusing on from a scientific point of view. So thank you very much to everybody, and Jillian especially, and Sharks for Kids, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think it is so interesting. Uh, I've been following your Twitter page for a while and we've connected on uh, some amazing images. So um, guys, definitely check out the website. We do have a fun little video you can see. Um, so, oh, do you have a, yeah, you can just leave it on that slide if you want, or if you want to stop sharing, it'll just jump back up to you as well. So okay. yeah. I can stop sharing. Yep. See, Good. Perfect. All right. Uh, yeah, we do have a fun little video on the website just showing that movement you can check out and we're actually working on a new activity um, So to focus more on the dermal denticles. So uh, really really interesting stuff and just People have watched me host these webinars. I've talked a lot about even if you're not Wanting to be a shark scientist, but you like to engineer things or you have sort of that kind of creative approach to things. This is equipment that's being used that wasn't necessarily designed to study shark skin. And when those things come together, yeah, it can be really beneficial. And so if you're interested in developing new techniques, I've talked about new tags, engineering methods of study. Yeah, there's a lot of ways that you can get involved, even if you're, even if you're not, you don't wanna be a shark scientist. There's still ways to, to help study or be part of that, which is really, really amazing. So, all right. So we have a couple of questions. All right, the first one that we always get people to ask this and I love to ask this. Um, it can be tough for some people, but do you have a favorite shark species? <laughs> I, I really don't have a favorite shark. It, it's like asking what's your favorite child. I think we have, uh, if you have multiple children, you, you feel they're all, equally wonderful. I, I like, um, I like a, 
all sharks from thresher sharks to white sharks, even the little chain cat sharks that just sit on the bottom because they're very cute and they're uh, friendly and they are um, just great uh, subjects to have in the lab. We have some in the lab now. And uh, I really have no favorite shark because they're all wonderful. <laughs> well, yeah, it's a good answer. I mean, it, it really is. And they're so diverse. It's, you know, we've talked about this in a lot of these. There's over 500 different species. So, uh, and you guys may have noticed just looking at the skin, how different they are. It's, they all have those dermal denticles, but yeah, the sizes and shapes are different. And uh, um, yeah, so hard to pick. I mean, I have a few of my favorites, but definitely just all of them and the more species that are discovered. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a really exciting, interesting animal. Yeah. All right, Sydney, thank you so much, Sydney, for joining us again. Sydney is a shark expert by now. I think Sydney has joined every single webinar. <laughs> so uh, Sydney, I think we're going to have you take over I think, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, teach us about some sharks. But Sydney would like to know, why did you choose this job? So probably maybe just kind of the science in general and how maybe you ended up, uh, you know, somebody else asked as well, like, how did you end up studying shark skin? So, you know, how did that all come together? Well, it's a great question. And I think it really began when I was very young and started snorkeling and, and looking under the surface of the water, going to a, you know, aquaria and just being becoming fascinated with what lives under the surface of the water. Um, there's so much life there. Uh, and uh, as I, you know, with that fascination, when I went to college then, I became a biology major and um, became, was able then to study um, biology and, and marine life and fishes. And then um, I just was very interested, became a scientist then. Um, and uh, decided to apply what I, what I was interested in or, or use what I was interested in as a scientist to um, begin to contribute myself to what we know about the world, the natural uh, marine world. And uh, the shark skins, sharks and shark skin specifically came about when I was an undergraduate taking a class in biology of fishes. There was discussion of sharks and their biology and a little bit about the skin, and it just fascinated me tremendously. And then Really, that, that was quite a while ago. We've known very little about shark skin since then. So I thought uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, oh, well, it'll be interesting to apply my research abilities and in my laboratory to shark skin, and maybe we can find out more about it. And we certainly have been able to do that. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty incredible. The scans, robots. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's really incredible to see a lot of times when we think of shark science, it's catching and tagging. And that's, you know, and yes, that's a lot of what is learned and, and methods for learning. But yeah, it's pretty incredible to see these other tools and technology that are helping us better understand these animals. Um, you know, robots to study sharks is, is pretty awesome. And I'm sure there's a lot of kids out there that that sounds pretty cool. <laughs> I think it sounds really cool. So, and probably something that, uh, you know, even 10 years ago, maybe no one thought was going to be yep. possible. And uh, yeah. I, I think that's very true, Jillian, that the technology, I mean, certainly for tagging has just increased tremendously. The, the technology for doing research in the laboratory for imaging shark skin, just to get 3D images of shark skin on a living animal within a few seconds is something that's only a few years old now that we've been doing and it's just uh it's amazing to see so those of you uh, young folks out there watching that you can look forward to lots of amazing new technology that will help us understand the biology of sharks yeah and i always like to say that you know if this is something you're interested in there's so many questions uh, still uh -huh. out there there'll be more questions as more species are discovered and we know a lot about sharks, but there's even more we don't know. And so, Absolutely. yeah, for students, you know, if you're thinking, okay, 10, 15, 20 years from now, there's still going to be a lot of questions to be answered. So yep. that's exciting. If you're interested in this, follow it, pursue it, because yeah, we're, we definitely need more marine scientists, um, engineers developing, you know, the tech to be able to do this work. Absolutely. And as, as the climate changes, it has a big impact on, on animal populations and sharks. And that's something that's not going to be changed. You know, it's going to keep changing. So those of you who are interested in sharks, you could have a, a long and very exciting uh, life as a, as a career working on sharks. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
All right, and Mr. Mako wanted to know what happens, which I like that name, yeah. um, if a shark loses one of the denticles. Do they grow back? And do they grow back like, I think, thinking of the teeth, like their teeth grow back really quickly? Uh, so what happens if they lose one? It's a great question. Um, and it's one certainly we're very interested in. The, what we've learned is that if they lose a denical, it's the process of replacement seems to be very different than tooth replacement in sharks. So, Mr. Mako, if you're, uh, you may well be aware of how sharks replace their teeth. They have uh, replacement teeth sort of all lined up and they are all rotating forward into the jaw. Whereas when a denical is lost on the skin surface, there's no replacement waiting underneath. It forms after the denical is lost and there aren't sort of a stack of denticles waiting to replace each one. There, each one pops out and a new one forms right underneath it. So it's not like a tooth replacement. It's a new process for replacing the skin denticles, but they do, do indeed and can indeed replace their denticles, which is something we really, we, we, I think we all thought it must happen, but no one's had ever gotten nice images of it. So we're excited to get those. Very cool, very cool. And another one that you kind of talked a little bit about was um, somebody asked if, if they can move them and you you know that video did show but i think they were probably saying like can they just like pick ones and, and move them all around but can you talk a little bit more about you know if you guys i don't know if this person saw the video or not but um yeah about the movement of the denticles it's a, it's a great question i think for the most part maybe with some exceptions but for the most part they cannot move individual denticles on the surface of the body so if you look on the side of a shark, they really have no individual control over those denticles. There are not little muscles going to each one, for example. But, but there's some, you know, a certain, like the movie I showed suggests that in that location, they might be able to move them. So I think there's still more to be discovered. I, I wouldn't, um, I'm gonna say they mostly can't move them, but I could be wrong. And that's the thing too is there's we like a lot of times the questions that have been asked and and you know we've had really great questions from the audience but is that we just don't know yet it's right. just not it's the, it may be yes maybe uh, you know and we may say okay it's probably that but yeah there's there's just still so many questions that exist which i think makes studying sharks really interesting um really yep. challenging <laughs> and uh, that kind of leads to the next question is there something that's the most challenging part about this particular research boy that's a good question i think the most challenging part is learning how to apply some of the new technology to understand the biology of sharks it's it's challenging but it is very exciting and interesting so it all goes together um, finding we knew for a long time we wanted to get three-dimensional images of the surface of shark skin but we couldn't figure out how to do it so that was challenging but then a new technology comes along and learning how to use that and use it uh, properly um, allowed us to answer that question so i think it's just learning how to use the new technology to um and apply it to understand sharks and i think the same would be true for tagging you know as you come up with new tagging ideas there's that process of learning how to use that technology to help you understand something interesting about sharks yeah very cool um is there somebody made an honest question but is somebody asked is there a shark skin or species that you would like to study but you haven't looked at yet I'm, I'm imagining there's a lot of them but if there's one in particular that you were just you would love to to see that up close i think some of the deep sea sharks are very interesting and specimens are very rare it would be great to see uh, we actually have imaged some pretty crazy species like the basking shark um which are just crazy uh sharks i mean they're just they're amazing um uh, so we've done a pretty good job but some of the deep sea species of sharks that are very rare hard to get um it would be really great to have some specimens of the skin now and of course i'd also love to go down in a submarine and just hang out and see what they're doing down there 
So maybe that's for some of you listening, that's your future. Maybe think about how to get down into the deep sea and see what those, those strange sharks are doing. Yeah. And I actually have a, this is sort of my question, but I think of like the prickly dogfish that obviously has quite large mm -hmm. um, dermal denticles. Uh, is that obviously because of, you know, they're not known for their speed. They're certainly not a, a mako right. shark. And, you know, I think that would be, I mean, you obviously really don't need the, the close-up scan to, to see the size of them because you can, for those of you guys, if you haven't seen, if you check on the website, we do have some photos of them. They're amazing. They're just this, I don't know, crazy little shark. They're deep sea species with these giant, like, prickly coat of armor uh, that you can actually see, which is incredible. So what about, is it most likely just the lack of speed is kind of how they've evolved to have that size? It could be, it could be protection too, um, just uh, against parasites or against being bitten by other members of their species. Even uh, like a nurse shark, which I'm sure you've seen many of, have very large denticles. If you get close to them, you can actually see the, the gaps in the denticles. They're missing denticles all over their bodies. And they're like little pavers. There's just such a great diversity from the prickly dogfish to a nurse shark. Um, and, and it's really, I think it's largely unknown um, what the function of those denticles is like in a prickly dogfish. I think a general rule is that the more high speed, fast moving sharks have smaller denticles that are more sort of overlapping, uh, like making little, you know, like a paving stones. But um, there's such a great diversity, and we really have no idea what, it, what it's doing. So there's a great, great questions for the future. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it's just, again, it goes back to the amazing diversity. They're all sharks, but they're incredibly different. Not just talking about the skin, but size, shape, swimming, diet, you know, migra migration. And, and so, yeah, and I think if anyone's seen a nurse shark photo, I have one I've taken that really up close. And, Yep. You can see the iridescence and the colors. Yes. It's just there. It's really quite stunning to see it up close and um, yeah, and the, the spaces and yeah, beautiful, beautiful little, an underwater tank. Like it's obviously they're a very sturdy shark. Yeah, um, they're amazing. The, the, the nurse sharks have beautiful different colored denticles too. It's, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, it's a piece of art. And they're obviously, I mean, very, very strong. We've seen some nurse sharks with some pretty significant bites in them that yep. obviously a much larger tiger shark or bull shark in the Bahamas where we are. And, uh, and they're like, it's, yeah, it's, they're surviving. They're fine. I mean, but it's, it's still been protected. It would have been much worse, I think on a different species, but. Right. Um, and even during, during reproductive behavior, they'll bite each other quite sub substantially. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You see the scars from that as well. And yeah, it's a, uh, it's some pretty, <laughs> pretty large markings you definitely see. Um, somebody else wanted to know, how do you select the shark? So you showed a few different species. Uh, is there, you know, how do you select that? I would imagine it's probably what you have access to, but is there, um, yeah, is there a selection process of, we definitely wanted a small shark, a big shark, a fast shark, a slow, you know, kind of those are general terms, but. I think that's exactly right. So we tried to get a diversity of shark species from ones that sit on the bottom, basically, to very fast moving sharks. Um, at, at Harvard, we have a very large collection of, of a biodiversity collection of, of fish that includes sharks. We have about a million and a half specimens to which uh, you are all invited. Jillian, I know if you come to the Boston area, you're welcome to see our fish I collection. I to it. Um, in in post-virus times. Um, uh, and so uh, we do pick the, sp the species we're interested in on the basis of swimming speed, or in the case of the thresher shark, you know, the, the amazing tail. I hope, I don't know if you were able to see the movie. Um, that I showed of the use, use of the tail, but uh, any shark that has a, a structure like that, that's so unusual, we would like to pick that species and look more closely. Have you, um, have you looked at the hammerhead? I wonder, I, I know you have a bonnet head. I think you sent me a, a mm -hmm. um, which for you guys, that's the smallest species of hammerhead. Uh, have you looked at, because I, I feel like it'd be really interesting to the cut on the head, the cephalofoil versus the dorsal fin or, you know, that's, you, you showed and you talked a little bit about that, the comparison, but they're not all the same, the whole body. There's patches where they're very different. Mm -hmm. have, have you looked at that or what do you think you might, if you haven't, like, do you suspect that there's quite a significant difference? 
I, I certainly would. Uh, no one that I know of has actually looked in a systematic way around the head of a hammerhead. Um, you know, a great hammerhead, they have a huge cephalofoil. And so it would be really interesting to look carefully all around that and look at the surface structure of the denticles. Um, denticles do change quite a bit uh, depending on um, if they're uh, near some of the sensory structures. So some of the uh, ampullae, they'll change right around the surface of that. I don't know if any of, uh, of the, our audience is aware of some of the superpowers that sharks have, um, but um, uh, those issues have been looked at, but not around the head of a hammerhead. That would be a great um, project to work on for sure. Very cool. So everyone listening out there, there's a, there's a shark project. Uh, we have Freya, age 10, uh, just wrote in, do the denticles in shark pups differ, for, differ from the adult sharks? Pretty good it's question. a great question. And the short answer is yes. So they do. They're much more spaced out. They tend not to have missing ones. And uh, as the shark grows, they all come together to make that beautiful surface over the, that covers the shark's skin. So when they're born, they have much more uh, spread out denticles. And they're much, they're simpler. Hmm, interesting. And one of the questions that I always like to ask as well is for anyone watching, and because um, we've obviously spoken to a lot of biologists, is do you have a bit of advice? Like what is maybe one of the things that you would suggest to people uh, for pursuing this kind of career? It could be kind of biology in general or something, you know, this kind of very specific work, but what's your piece of advice uh, for students out there watching? Oh, it's a great question. So I would say um, uh, in, in school, study biology if you can. When you can take a biology class, take a biology class. Um, on your own, do some reading and try and un read about animals, uh, read about marine life. Uh, um, if you can convince your, your families to take you somewhere where you can snorkel, uh, get in the water, um, that's always great. And then uh, go to plan to go to college and study biology. And at that time, you'll be able to specialize a little more. Um, Along the way, sometimes in, in high school, you can volunteer or participate in a variety of different programs that different marine stations have for high school students uh, or even younger where you can go and you can help with research and learn in a, in a, in a setting like uh, where you are, Jillian. And I think that's a great, there's no real substitute for getting in the water and just seeing what it, what it all looks like. Um, beyond what you might study in an academic environment. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I always tell people, you know, volunteering, internships, learning yeah. to dive, to fish, to run a boat, you know, all of those things are if, uh, or if you're interested in lab work, volunteer at a lab, get that hands-on experience, yeah. whatever, wherever in the field that you want to be, uh, getting hands-on experience is, is yeah. super important. Plus it's fun, it's interesting, yes. and it's a great way to figure out if you really like the work, actually. Um, yeah. You know, a lot of times we only see the glamorous side of things on, on the internet because that's what, you know, we share. And, and uh, But all of us, and probably more so now, are a lot of time behind computers and right. planning and fundraising and, you know, all the, the, the stuff that's not as fun is actually being in the water with the sharks or actually doing uh, that particular uh, you know, aspect of the research. So um, definitely, but well, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to everybody who joined us for all the wonderful questions um, and uh, for Dr. Lauder for joining us and sharing with these amazing images and research with us. Um, his link to Twitter is on, if you were on the webinars page, we have more information, website, Twitter. Uh, you will see some really cool stuff on your Twitter page. I always enjoy it uh, as new updates and new images come out. So definitely worth a follow to see some really cool stuff. Um, thank you so much for your time, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Thank You're very you welcome. It was a pleasure. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.